a better understanding of a BASA strike zone. Now, you're going to be like, well, a strike zone, yeah, no, no, this is obvious. No, this is not an obvious topic, and I'll tell you why. This is something, one of the topics that I honestly believe what separates top-end tour-level angler guys versus your weekend warriors. You know, you're like, I, I know as much as this guy, these guys are out there fishing. It's just the money. They just have the money to do it. No, not really. What happens is a lot of these guys are very intuitive. They're like connected with what they're doing through under 100% throughout the day, where a lot of guys are very distracted by what they have going on at home or had a bad morning and can't let it go and can't think straight throughout the day. And so these topics I'm going to get into right here is something you have to remain focused on throughout the day as much as possible. And you've heard me say this in other videos. And you're thinking to yourself, well, you know why I say don't have that buddy in the boat that's distracting you. And this is coming down to the same thing because I am guilty of not focusing on 100% of where that bass strike zone is. So I'm going to elaborate on a few things that I think is going to better help you wrap your head around it. So let's think about when a bass is a juvenile. What are they doing? They're constantly hiding. Everything's trying to attack them. That's in their genetics. They know they have to hide to survive. Now, let's think about this example. How many times have you cast it over the water and you see things move? It scatters. It shoots out of the way real quick. They see your lure 20, 30, you know, five feet, way up there, above your head. It doesn't matter. Low, high, it doesn't matter. The fish still sees it. They know a bird's in subsurface prey, above the surface prey. Everything's trying to attack them. So genetically, bass are programmed to hide in ambush feed. So you honestly have to keep in mind what is the best position where that bass can ambush, hide, or effectively trap without becoming prey itself. Because no matter how large a bass gets, they always have that prey, that victim mentality. And let me give you a scenario right here. How many times have you cast it up to a shade pocket and you see your line run to deep water? Okay, those bass are not comfortable. This happens here on the lake I live on all the time. If you don't know, um, I've been doing this full time for almost 18 years now. I fish over 280 days a year and bass fishing is my specialty, although I love fishing for everything. So when you throw up there and that bass grabs it and he runs out deep, he's running to deep water. He is not comfortable living shallow. He knows he's a higher percentage chance of becoming prey. Even if that bass is 10 pounds, they still have that mentality of be careful or you're going to become somebody's dinner. So. When you're out there fishing, okay, and this is, this is on another topic too. I'm going to do another video about complacent casting, and I'll tell you what, there's a lot of details in that one you're not going to want to miss out on either. But so you get out there, let's say the grass is three feet on the bottom, okay, it's coming up three feet off the bottom, and you're in eight foot of water, and you're casting a, uh, let's say, an underspin with a swim bait on it, okay, there's shad around there. And your bait is coming two foot over the top of that grass line. But your buddy's casting the identical setup with you, but he's ticking the grass line. I don't need to tell you who's going to catch the most fish here, right? We all know the answer to that. Your buddy, that's ticking the grass line. Unless it's like low light hours and the fish are willing to chase, then of course it may be more equal. But when that sun's up is the majority of most bass fishing days. The majority of the day, we go out there and we maybe have 40, 45 minutes, maybe an hour if you're an early bird. You get out there and you have that low light period where the shadows are long, but the fish's strike zone's larger. They're willing to chase, and that's because they're not lit up like a stop sign. The sun's not beaming down on them. The, the prey typically can't see them, and they're much more apt to chase, just why, like, heavy overcast days, everybody knows it's low pressure, the fish are more willing to chase. But my focus here is on talking about the tough hours of the day. When your shadow, you know, is this big around your feet, the sun's straight overhead. That's the majority of our bass fishing day. And this is where guys mess up on understanding strike zones. They're casting out there, they're reeling it in, they're water, the bait's spending too much time high in the water column or not deep enough into the structure cover. 
So let's get into what the bass are most comfortable with. Let's forget low light hours. We're talking sun straight overhead right now. They want to be buried into something. They want to be in dark shade or they want to be directly against an object. I don't care if it's a rope, a wire, a bass will suspend right next to it. I've seen it tens of thousands of times, a, a dock cable, or they'll be under, they'll be buried back under matted vegetation, under a dock. They do not want to be seen. At no point throughout that fish's day, when the sun is straight up, does it want to be lit up like a stop sign so something can come grab it. If you do see a bass out in the open, typically something else is going on. Maybe it's in the spring, uh, the female bass is up there sunning, incubating its eggs, but typically the ones that you could just see out in open water are not actively feeding. There is ways to trick those, but that's not what this video is about. Um, otherwise, they become prey. Now, where this rule does not apply is schooling. When the bass are schooled up, fish feel comfortable in numbers. It's just like an anchovy. When they're all in balls, you watch the Nature Channel, they're all schooled up, they're in a giant ball. It's that one that comes out that becomes the prey. And they feel comfortable when they're schooling. So this is why you see the inception of forward-facing sonar, offshore fishing, and they're finding these schooling fish in open water and able to catch them. Um, those fish are comfortable. That's where being against something, under something, buried in the shade, or next to something, that next to something is the other fish. So that is the exception uh, to that rule. So keep that in mind. So when you're out there, I'm going to use like the California Delta for an example. If I go out and it's... Um, shoot i'm halfway through may right now to where the sun's becoming intense the fish do not want to be out in visual water where they can become prey so we got to keep this in mind so a month ago where i was throwing a weightless wacky senko up there let's say i got four or five foot over the top of the grass and it's falling those fish were willing to come get it it was pre-spawn they were active instinct was taking over for them but if I was fishing it a lot closer to the grass and my bites are coming once it gets down there and they can comfortably come out of the grass, get it and go right back in. Okay. So that strike zone as the day progresses will become smaller and smaller. Like I said, low light, they may come all the way up to the surface to grab it. When the sun's directly overhead, it's going to be when it dang near touches that grass or lands in that grass where they can sneak out and grab it. All right. That strike zone is going to shrink in theory at that point. Now, you may get a dumb one, and congratulations if you find the dumb ones. Those are my favorite. But as the day progresses, and it's summertime, let's, 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 go, let's go July, just so you can have a prime example. This is where structure, cover, you know, boat docks, all that stuff becomes very, very valid. Deep boulders, deep water, and or ledges, okay? Because what applies there? Shade, cover hiding spot. This is what applies. So let's say if I go out with a, a vibrating jig, a chatterbait, have you, and I have uh, the exact same setups tied on, okay, and I hand a chatterbait to my co-angler, and we're rotating in the front, and there's a drop-off, a weed ledge, all right? I have to pay attention to the sun. Where's the sun, okay? If the sun is coming from this side and there's a weed ledge here, the shade is here. So I want to be down ticking the weeds on the edge of that shade. And if I am not paying attention and just say, oh, that grass over there looks good. This grass over here looks good. I'm not going to work my bait effectively in that strike zone the whole time. If I am paying attention and my buddy's not paying attention, it doesn't matter what lure we have on it does not apply so you're going to hear about in the delta or okeechobee or any other lake where you can flip and punch flipping and punching why is flipping and punching work so well in the summertime but simple it's heavy cover or it's some sort of you brush is cover trees are cover matted vegetation stuff blowing into a corner creates a solid canopy 
ultraviolet's not even going through there. This is why frog fishing is so good in the summertime because it pins them under there. They're going to be under there trying to feed on bluegills or crawfish or something way back under where they're comfortable. They're not in a prey position. They're in a predator position. You got to remember, they start off as prey. So, you know, that's how it goes and they become predator, but they always feel like they're being preyed on. So you need to think where that predator can be comfortable to prey and not to be preyed on. So having that in mind, punching, flipping becomes highly effective. Uh, also deep cranking in the summertime, boulders, ledges, because there's shade down behind them. And if you can find the fish concentrated together, remember schooling mentality takes over to where they're more comfortable to run stuff down. Um, one other exception to the rule is big swim baits to where it's moving slowly, whether it's a glide or a big boot tail, you know, creeping through slow to where it looks wounded and it's a large meal. That can be an exception as well because the opportunity is so great that they're willing to let their guard down. But you can tell strictly by how the fish follows it, whether you're visually looking at it or you have forward facing sonar. If the fish is well under it, and you can see them following deep, all right, you know, chances are it's by itself. If they're high up behind it, oftentimes you'll see one, two, or three, and they'll come up right next to it and stare at it. And this is with it being near nothing. There's no tramp, no trap points. There's no tree. Uh, the surface can be a trap point, but there's no bridge column, nothing. This is open water. And you have multiple fish follow. Well, he was more comfortable or she was more comfortable because she had that schooling mentality going on. They feel safer in numbers. So you can make that strict adjustment right there. Now, you may be able to get one of those fish to swing or not. All right. So you focusing on all this throughout the day is very, very tricky to do. You, you need to stay in contact with the cover or in contact with the structure that those fish are on as the sun's straight up overhead. Or you need to get right on top of where you know they're in, whether that's a frog, or go right through whether that's punching, or go in and behind the shade lines, whether that's deep cranking, dragging a jig, a drop shot, whatever have you. Be more focused on where that fish's strike zone is most prevalent. Because any time you are asking them to leave that strike zone, you are decreasing the chance of getting a bite. Anyone can catch a reaction fish when it's low light and they're actively feeding. That's the easy time. Everyone knows, you know, sunrise and sunset are the uh, guaranteed times because the fish's strike zone becomes much larger. But catching them throughout the middle of the day is what separates the men from the boys. And keeping these strategies in mind and staying in that most comfortable zone where they can remain being predators and not prey is something you have to keep in mind at all times. You know, and this is why when you look at forward facing sonar and all this offshore fishing technology, and you know, people stop talking about side image. Um, <laughs> I still think side image is by far uh, the most effective uh, electronic tool you have for uh, offshore fishing for finding them. I would take side image over forward facing sonar uh, any day of the week because I know how to catch fish. So it's all good. Um, granted, forward facing sonar helps. But uh, the, going back to the subject of why you see more guys using forward facing because of that schooling mentality that they are willing to actively attack because they feel comfortable. So these fish may be down on a ledge, they may be down on a boulder, but they're together and you can catch multiple fish. Whereas let's say you're fishing shallow and you see a lay down, there may be one or two fish on there, but you flip in there, you hit that fish, yank them out. You may have spooked the other two, but as you can still see guys like John Cox, Greg Hackney, you know, they're still in your top 50 guys and these are shallow water specialists. All right. They have to keep this in mind at all time. You know, Andy Morgan, you got, you got all, all these guys that are really good target casters, flippers, uh, Ish Monroe, Ish is still up there. One of those shallow water specialists. Why didn't they fall off with the inception of forward facing sonar? 
So if you trust me, they can learn how to use it like everybody else, but they know they're going to get those big bites and they know how to manage to get five each time uh, by doing this. But I guarantee you, if they were not thinking about this, they wouldn't stand much of a chance. And the reality is they probably have this in their mind 100% of the day, along with a lot of other mental tools that they've gained along the way. I'm often quoting that uh, fishing is mental puzzle pieces. And the more of those puzzle pieces you can assemble that day, you get an idea of what the bigger picture looks like. And you can assemble those other pieces to go along with that picture. And then you become more and more effective as you establish that pattern until Mother Nature does something and the picture changes for that day or the next day. So these are all things that you need to keep in mind. So let's, let's talk about another one here ambush positions, ambush points, okay? A lot of people say ambush points, but I think people are association, associating an actual point. Um, so let's talk about ambush position right here. I was just at the lake two days ago, not yesterday, two days ago, and I caught, um, I caught 14 bass on a Magnum Shine Glide, a nine and a half inch bait, 14 fish in one day. I think that was my second or third best numbers day for a glide bait that big and i happen to figure out something very early all right there's this big leafy plant that goes out the fish were suspended next to it and i would throw out past it and i would see the fish rise okay follow the glide bait and turn off i was asking that fish to leave their strike zone they were traveling too far away from the strike zone they couldn't pin it. They didn't have an ambush position. So instead, I actually put that cover in between me and the cast. I would cast about 20 foot, 30 foot past it, and I would bring it near the side of that cover until I got the follow. And then I would try to direct my glide bait into that cover. And I physically watched, and uh, I'll show you some clips. Follow my Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. And you'll see the clips. I post it. And you, and you can see me looking and working it. And I worked that glide into that cover to where I almost impact the cover. And the fish's strike zone is right there. And they had an ambush position. I physically watched the fish. Here's my glide. I watched the fish go around, hide behind a piece of cover. And then my glide came up. And then boom. Then they took it at that point. And granted, I would have had follows all day. If I didn't set up a trap point or bring it into that fish is strike zone. I could have thrown the glide and watch fish follow it all day long. Then I found another pattern out on main lake points. This is not an ambush point. This is a main lake point, a point that goes way out into the lake. There was this growth coming up off the bottom. And I found where the growth came up to about three and a half feet is where all the post spawn fish were out and sitting in. Now, I cast it over, and I was watching. I don't, I don't even have forward-facing sonar on my sponsor, but I have it on my lake management boat, the boat I keep, the 1980 Ranger that we all did up that's in my backyard. I do have forward-facing sonar on there. It helps me manage the uh, carp and species and growth in the lake. Uh, but on my sponsor boat, I don't even have forward-facing sonar uh, on there. I have nothing against it. I'm just a shallow water specialist, so I just haven't done it yet. But I threw out there, okay, and I was throwing over seven foot. And I got a couple of follows. I said, okay, well, this is interesting. Then I threw over another area and I let it drop down to where I was probably within about a foot and a half, two foot of that growth top. And then bang, a six pounder smacked it. I missed the hook set on her. Um, but then she followed it back to the boat. Didn't take another swing. But it was that adjustment out on that main lake point, letting when I cast it out, letting it sink and then following that weed line up at that angle and i very could have easily just fished it high on the water column tried to give her a trap point against the surface and not got that fish to chase because it was the middle of the afternoon um, and i asked that fish to travel too far these fish were comfortable only coming out of the cover a foot two foot and they almost wanted it touching to eat which is very very common now along with that Let's look at this point, okay? Let's say this is the dirt. This is my boat. Um, trap points, where the water becomes shallow. 
so the bottom becomes a trap point and the surface becomes a trap point is if you're just casting and winding it's usually in your best interest to have your boat shallower casting deeper and bringing it up into that shallower water if you do have a fish that's following your lure that trap point becomes a better ambush opportunity for them to get it because in shallow water the bait has less direction to escape this is why in big swim baits and stuff you'll see us or a rigs you'll see us sitting up shallow throwing out deep and bringing it back up to create a trap point uh, for those fish so that's another thing you need to keep in mind all right one last thing before i wrap this up i know it's getting long but this is something i really want you guys to wrap your head around wind sun sun wind sun and current okay whether you have a very windy day then you're going to get natural current uh, a dam that maybe uh, creates current maybe you live on a river system a tidal system wherever the water if you have substantial water movement coming one direction if it's walking speed or faster the fish are always going to face into that current so two trains of thought right here if you cast up current or upwind and you bring the bait that's how that's the position that they are naturally feeding if you were not getting bit that way and that's the way i suggest casting the majority of the time you should always bring the bait with the wind with the current into the shade into the cover into the structure to make contact that's the most natural possible way you can do it sometimes they're not hungry so when it comes to flipping if you're coming straight to the surface and dropping straight down. I do not think wind direction or current direction applies whatsoever to flipping. So now granted, you can say most likely they're going to be, if the grass is leaning over, of course, under where the grass is leaning over, creating that shade. Well then sure, I guess the wind kind of applies, but that's more target oriented. You punch that bait through there. Uh, and get them that way. But I really want you guys to try to remain focused throughout the day. Positive energy. Know you're going to figure it out. Remain thinking and remain focused on where that predator is not focused on not being prey, but rather focused on itself being a predator. Because once that sun comes up, you know, that's probably a less likely feeding time than the low hours. And you're going to have to trick them. You're going to have to be more efficient at remaining in that strike zone don't become complacent focus on that strike zone think like you're the fish and hopefully you'll catch some more guys i'm nick the informative fisherman appreciate you watching the video thanks guys